like for you to take your Bible with me this morning and turn back to John chapter 3. <clears throat> and one of the things that I have just been overwhelmed with in beginning this study is the magnitude of what our Lord sets forth in such few words of a truth. He was indeed the Word of God. Because no man, no natural man other than one who himself was God could set forth so much by saying so little. And I tell you, my generation, and several generations now, they, they have such little understanding of this all-important truth we're going to talk about this morning. This message is actually entitled, The New Birth, Part 1. Because we're not, it's going to take a while to get through this. Now it will. And as we begin to take a close look at the new birth, or regeneration and conversion, or as most modern evangelicals call it today, you've got to be born again. You must be born again. That's the way our Lord spoke of it. Please keep in mind throughout this entire study the context of our Lord's teaching here. Because that's so important. He, think about that. This is, now I know there's four Gospels. But in the Gospel of John, where we're at this morning, this is the first doctrinal discourse our Lord Jesus Christ speaks in his earthly ministry. I'd say the first words out of a person's mouth are about as important as the last words that come out of their mouth, aren't they? In the case of our Lord Jesus Christ, all his words were important. But what gets me is in this first discourse, the first thing our Lord begins to doctrinally speak of or teach of, it's not about immorality and ungodliness or being without religion. Because you know, as we, we've already looked, who's here? There is a religious, moral, sincere, dedicated Pharisee a ruler of Israel who has sought our Lord by night, who is absolutely enamored with but one thing. What's he caught up with? I know that no man could do the miracles that you do except God be with him. All he saw was what? A man. That's all he was consumed with. But here's the thing. He made this statement. Look at verse 2 of, our, of, of John 3 again. Look at this. What, this is a statement he made. He says, The saying came to Jesus by night, and he came at night because he was fearful for repercussion if he had been caught by any of his brethren. He knew what, to, what was going to be the recourse in the matter. Came to Christ by night, said to him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, Instructor, a, a, a word that the Jews used in reference to a teacher that was higher than themselves. It was a, a, a badge of honor. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now you think about it. The first discourse our Lord's going to talk, speak of, he doesn't deal and he doesn't speak it to the immoral or the ungodly, or the irreligious. Who does he speak it to? The moral, the sincere, the dedicated, the religious. And Nicodemus made this statement. And what I find so amazing about this, our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't even address what he says. He just abruptly changes the entire course of the entire conversation and he looks at this man and he brings forth one of the greatest, most essential truths that's set forth in the New Testament. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, not an immoral, ungodly pervert, but a religious, moral, sincere, dedicated man who was responsible for the teaching and instruction in religious matters for national Israel. Except you, a man, be born again, 
He cannot see the kingdom of God. What an indictment. Christ didn't begin by asking Nicodemus. He didn't ask Nicodemus, Nicodemus, do you want to be born again? That didn't how he started it out. That's how Billy Graham would. How most in modern religion, do you, don't you want to be born again? And I tell you what, Christ didn't begin by asking him, do you want to say the sinner's prayer? He didn't even begin by saying, do you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Doesn't even come up. He boldly and definitively declared and keep this in mind at this point in time. Now we know later on this man contended for the body of Christ after his death. We know at one point in his life after this occasion, he stood against his brethren and they looked at him and said, you, you also, you, you with him? But at this point in time, you know what this man was? This man, Nicodemus, was an unregenerate sinner. And he told this unregenerate sinner, unless you, you, you religious, moral, sincere, dedicated, kind, compassionate man, people say, they weren't kind and compassionate. I guarantee you, folks, they walked a straight and narrow. Now, they were some mean rascals, but I guarantee you they were good to their family, good to their friends, good to those who followed them. Told him, except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And the second time, he tells him in verse 5, unless you're born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Christ tells every single solitary sinner the same exact truth in this discord. Apart from a work of God in a sinner's heart, a sinner's mind, a sinner's understanding, unless they're born again, unless the new birth occurs, they cannot possibly be saved. Now look at the discord. Look at verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I know I've told you this so many times, it sounds like a broken record. Our Lord starts off this all-important discourse with a repetition of the same word. Verily, verily. Found out some, something this week. This word is translated verily. He repeats verily, verily. If it's used at the beginning of a statement, it's of a truth of a truth. If this, and there's cases in the scriptures where it's used at the end of a statement, it means amen. So we can look at this either way. Amen and amen, which to us, when we say amen, we get to the end of the prayer and we use the phrase amen. What do we mean by it? So be it. Or let it be done. So our Lord starts off and he says, Verily, verily, of a truth, of a truth. In other words, Christ starts out by stressing to him and stressing to you and me. Folk, this thing in the new verse is important. It's so important that later on in this same narrative, our Lord Jesus Christ said, You a teacher in Israel and you don't know about this? Listen to me. In this all-important matter, of eternal life or eternal death, it always begins with, subsists in, and finds its conclusion in who? In the Lord. Jonah got it right. He stated it correctly when he was in the whale's belly. He turned his, and I don't know how he did this, but he turned his head toward the temple. Now, I don't know how in the world, David, when you're in a whale's belly, swimming around under the ocean, you know where the temple is. But he turned his heart and his mind toward the temple where God Almighty Shekinah glory dwelt. And he said, salvation is, is in italics, he says, salvation of the Lord. In its entirety. John, the same John that records our Lord's word, listen to this, he recorded it. I, I learned so much this week. This is amazing. In John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, here's a familiar passage. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, authority, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. People go wild there. See, 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 see. The way you become a child of God is you've got to believe on him. You, 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 you believe on him, you become a child of God. They stop there. They don't read on. Which, 
And, and underline this, these next two words, which were born. You hear that? Which were, didn't say they would be born. Or after they believed, David, that, they, that they'd become something different. Which were born, not by nat, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. How were they born? But of God. We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the new birth is what we're talking about. And this is what I discovered this week. This phrase translated, be born, except a man, there's two words together, English word, it's one word in the Greek, except a man be born. That, that word is translated be born. And in this verse in John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, the phrase is translated by two English words, were born, same exact Greek word. Same exact Greek, and it's a verb in both instances. Again, not English major, verbs are important. And here's what I discovered. This, this Greek word that's translated is born, be born, and were born, in the Greek, it means of men, if it's speaking of men, it's of men who fathered children like Abraham or Adam, his new Eve, his wife. He, he fathered the two boys. Or of women, it means who give birth to children. Either way, it means the same thing. And in both verses, the verb is in what's called the aorist tense. Now, I'm not, not big on word, but and we don't have anything in the English that relates to the aorist tense. The closest thing we can come to the aorist tense, it's a past tense, something that has already occurred. So, uh, something else too. Verbs not only have tenses, you know what else they've got? They've got a voice. And this, both these words, both places, it's in the passive voice. Anybody know anything about English? What's the passive voice? But the bo here, here's, here's the passive voice, vo voice in our English. The boy was hit by the ball. The subject in that sentence is what? Boy. And it's in the passive voice because he, he didn't go out there and hit himself with the ball. What happened? The ball hit him. And so it's in the passive voice, meaning that the recipient of the action, they got all the action done to them. They didn't have anything involved in doing the action. So Christ tells Nicodemus, as well as all those who would hear and read these glorious words, only those who would take the original language, only those who are fathered by God are only those who have been given birth to by God. They're the only ones that can see. You see this? They're the only ones who can see the kingdom of God. This word see is important. And it's critical to our understanding of what our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching here as the eternal logos of God. I tell, throughout my entire life is a justified saint. One who's believed and rested in Christ is the Lord my righteousness. I have encountered a plethora of men and women who hold the position, and they will try to defend it, that Christ Jesus never spoke anywhere in his ministry. He never spoke specifically about man's fall in Adam. They'll say and try to defend the position. In other words, they, they say, Christ didn't ever teach anything about total depravity or total inability. And they say, well, Christ didn't ever teach anything about God choosing people before the foundation of the world. Or they've, they've told me repetitively, I had a, one preacher preach a whole message on this. I listened to the message. He said, nowhere in the entirety of our Lord's ministry or the apostles' ministry in the book of Acts did they e never, ever mention the limited nature or aspect of the atonement of Christ. They say Christ never taught anything about irresistible grace. Not specifically. And he certainly never taught anything about perseverance of his people. I tell you what, 
just from this week of study, I can take John chapter 3. Just John 3. Not the entire New Testament. John 3. I can define, I can defend, and I can document all five of those truths from John chapter 3. Every one of them. I'm not going to do it this morning because we're dealing with but one aspect of it. And the aspect I want to deal with is this. Total depravity. Total depravity. You think about this. This word see. You know what it means in the original? It means to perceive with the eyes. I, I, know, I know that's what see. To, in other words, I can look on something and I can see it. Or it means this. To perceive with the senses. Now follow my reasoning. If Christ clearly states that no man can see, no man can perceive with his eyes or perceive with his senses the kingdom of God, unless they're born again. That's what he said. That's not my words, that's his word. Doesn't that set forth the total inability of man by nature? To do anything that could gain, attain, or maintain salvation? Doesn't that teach the exact same thing our Lord Jesus Christ taught in John chapter 6, 44, when he said, No man can come to me except my Father which has sent me draw him. He repeated it again in John chapter 6, verse 65. See, the total inability of any man by nature being able to see the kingdom of God in this verse and the total impossibility of any man actually being able to enter into the kingdom of God is going to be set forth when we get down to verse 5. They set forth the same exact doctrine which the Apostle Paul declared in Ephesians chapter 2. Turn over there real quick, Ephesians 2. Same doctrine. People say, oh, Christ didn't believe and teach anything like that. Do you think Paul taught something different than our Lord? Notice here, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened, is in italics, so it wasn't in the original, but it, it actually bears that because of what's said in the following verses, particularly down in verse 5. And you who were dead, you see that? Were dead, dead means lifeless. It's a lifeless corpse. How dead is this man Nicodemus? Uh-huh. Isn't it amazing? Alive and dead at the same time. Breathing, dead as a doornail. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our behavior in times past and the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And notice this. It doesn't say we're children of wrath. It says we were by nature children of wrath. It's a difference. We've, listen, the elect of God have never and will never be under the wrath of God. But according to nature, in our own mind, before the Lord revealed himself to, I was under the wrath of God in my mind, wasn't I? I was afraid of him, fearful, worried, anxious, trying hard to improve myself and straighten things out that I knew I had messed up. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love. See, this is what tells me I've never been under the wrath of the Lord. I've just been a wrath, children of God, wrath by nature. For his great love wherewith he, what? Loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, this was written at least 2,000 years before I was born. But in the mind, will, I, purpose of God Almighty, I was dead as these people he's writing this to. And this man Nicodemus that stood in front of our Lord. Dead in sins hath quickened us. That, what that quick? To make alive. How did he make us alive? With Christ. By grace are you saved. Here's the doctrine. 
All men, you hear me? All men by nature are dead in trespasses and sin. Totally depraved. Meaning what? That they're the worst lot of men and women that's ever existed. Nope. All men by nature are totally depraved. I told them this morning in the Sunday Bible class hour, I'll give you the most simple description from the scriptures and definition of total depravity. Void of a righteousness that equals and answers the demands of God's law and justice. Anybody who does not possess the righteousness of Christ, they are totally depraved. You hear me? I don't care if he's standing in a pulpit or he's in a bar or a house of ill repute or he's standing there with a smoking gun in his hand where he's blew his wife or children's brains out. He is totally depraved. She is totally depraved who is ignorant of the righteousness of God. That's total depravity. Not total immorality. It's total depravity. I tell you, by Christ's twice repeated declaration of the necessity that one must be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, Christ declares this man, Nicodemus, to be totally depraved, unwilling, though he was moral, sincere, dedicated, and unable to see or enter the kingdom of God. I found out, this is not in my notes, but I think this is so interesting. The, the word, the phrase kingdom of God is used 69 times in the New Testament. In the gospel, not the New Testament, in the gospel, 69 times. John is really one of the more lengthy of the, the, the Gospels. The word that's translated kingdom of God is used but two times in the entirety of the Gospel of John. One time in verse 3 and one time in verse 5. Never used again. And I'm telling you what, John, if you want to know the theme and the makeup and the consistency of the Gospel of John, it's about the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, His Godhood. And when we're talking about His Godhood and our being united to Him, the only time He refers to the kingdom of God, He refers to it in talking about the necessity that we must be born again to see it or enter it. No doubt Nicodemus was a moral man, that he was a sincere man, that he was a religious man. And I tell you, he was certainly a man who was intrigued. I tell you, he was more intrigued than old Zacchaeus who had climbed up that tree to see our Lord. He come out there, I want... I, you know what I think he wanted? I think he wanted... It was kind of like he had gone to, to Las Vegas and he wanted to see some magician perform some trick. It was like, show me something. Do it for me. Like if he had seen something, it would have made him believe. That's, people think that. They think, if I could just see something. Yeah, we, make, we all make stupid statements. I remember when I used to say, if I'd have just been there when the Red Sea was parted. No, you know what? I'd have been standing there. Would to God we have stayed back over in Egypt? Made bricks without mortar and without, you know, we've got to make them up, chew the stuff up and make it. But no, oh, no. Not, uh, not him. Not going to believe this God. But this man is an unregenerate. This man, the one who's standing there questioning Christ about miracles. Folks, this, this man's mind was at enmity against God. No, it wasn't. He's out there. I'm telling you, you are denying what the Scripture set forth. The carnal mind, the unregenerate mind, is right now, presently, at bitter hatred against God Almighty. Here's a good question. What is it that Christ is saying a sinner can't see apart from being born again? Christ didn't leave it up for conjecture. And he didn't leave it up for me and you to debate about it. He tells you and me, except a man's born again, born of water, born of the Spirit, they cannot see and they cannot enter. That important phrase, what? The kingdom of God. 
Paul said this. Listen to you. For the, here's the same phrase. And it's exactly the same as what our Lord uses. John, Paul wrote in Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. In other words, what it, it ain't got nothing to do. Those are two things that are essential. Do you understand why he used meat and drink? Huh? Go back and read the Sermon on the Mount. Take no thought what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Because why? All that's got to do with what? This world. So it's not things down here, but here it is. Here's the kingdom of God. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So what's the kingdom of God? It's the kingdom of righteousness. Wherein dwelleth peace and joy and comfort. And security. He said to the Corinthians, For the kingdom of God is not in word. But here's a boy, here's this and got me this week. In power. And I got to look at that word this week and I thought, I can't let it go. I cannot let that word go. So I got to looking at it. And Paul used this word, this word that he used, he said, told these Corinthian believers what the kingdom of God is. He said it's power, it's significant. In the original language, you know what it is? It's the word. Here's his word. I, love, I even love saying this word, dunamis. We get from that word, what do we get? When you hear the word dunamis, what do you think about? Dynamite. That's what we get our English word dynamite from. And it means, here's what it means. This word translated power, the kingdom of God, is not in word. What is it? It's in power. It means inherent power. Power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. You hear that? Power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or which a person or thing exerts or puts forward. Now keep that in mind. Keep that, that, that definition in your head. Paul used the same word. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, what? The gospel, here's the same word, is the power. What is it? It's the dunamis. It's the inherent power. Right? The power of God. Unto salvation to every man that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now think back to that word dunamis and its meaning. Inherit power. Power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. Now think about us by nature. Think about Nicodemus. What is he? What's his nature? Remember what I told you a couple weeks ago, that great evangelical evangelist of our day, he said, if you'll believe on Christ, the new birth will occur, which is the power to transform your lives. That ain't got nothing to do with the new birth. Not one thing. Because listen, we have no inherent power. You can't work this up. Since we have no inherent power in us, on what basis or how could any sinner be born again but by the power of God? Paul tells it because he, he didn't stop in verse 16. Not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to every man that believeth, the Jew first and also to the Greek. For why therein, in the gospel, what's revealed? is the righteousness of God revealed from faith, from this book, to what? To the faith which God gives His elect. And what did His elect do with this faith revealed? With that faith they've been given in regeneration and conversion. They believe the just live by faith. I have never seen the righteousness of God. Have you? I trust it alone. That's it. I trust that righteousness that I cannot and have never seen is my only hope. It's all I got. We sing that song. 
This is all my hope and peace. What? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. You see that? People tell me all the time, I believe, I believe, I believe. It's one thing to believe, it's another to love it. And you cannot love this unless you've been born again. This will not become your all-consuming nature to rest in that which you had no part in producing and are maintaining. What's he talking about here? The, except you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. He's talking about a kingdom of righteousness. Men don't see that. This kingdom of righteousness, what does it rest in? It rests in Christ alone, who is the Lord our righteousness. He alone is the righteousness of God which you and I are made and He can only be seen, He can only be known, He can only be understood and folks, this kingdom of righteousness can only be entered into by those who have been born again. Is that clear enough? In order for me to be born again, folks, what's got to happen? I've got to have this kingdom of righteousness preached to me. Somebody's got to tell me. Somebody's got to point me to Him as my only hope and cause of salvation. Paul wrote to the Hebrew brethren. He says, Wherefore, listen to this language, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. <laughs> it's unmovable. It's the same kingdom our Lord Jesus Christ said, On this rock I'll build my church, and what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We've received that kingdom of God. Not I'm hoping to get it, Sam. I got it. Right now, sinner by birth, by nature, by practice, by choice. A rebel too much of the time. Still. His kingdom is received. Rested in you. Relied upon by godly fear. He said, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Our God. He ain't going to consume me. You don't have his kingdom. What's coming your way? Consumption. That's all. This kingdom which every elect sinner sees and enters into, this kingdom which cannot be moved, it cannot be moved for one reason only. It's foundation. That's it. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. He's writing to the Ephesians. Who at the end of this book, he tells them, quit lying to each other. You that stole, quit stealing. <laughs> you are no more strangers and foreigners. You are fellow citizens with the saints, the ones that are already in heaven, and the household of God, and are, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself also being the chief cornerstone. Keep this in mind. Satan's one goal and design is to keep you blinded but from one thing. What's he want to keep you ignorant of? The righteousness of God. Seeing the glory of God in the face of our Lord and Jesus Christ. I tell you, we see this blindness on display in this man Nicodemus. He was moral, he was sincere, he was religious, and he was curious. But Nicodemus couldn't see the kingdom of God. He didn't. All he saw was a miracle working man. But thank God, the new birth, which is a sovereign work of God the Holy Spirit, gives men's eyes to hear, ears to hear, eyes to see the kingdom. And this kingdom of righteousness is found but one place. It's found exclusively in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, our sinner, surety, substitute, redeemer, and friend. Let me give you a good example of the new birth. I'm not going to go there and read it, but I, write down this verse. Write down Luke chapter 23. I don't have time to go there and read it. And without even going there, know this. It was a thief on a cross. And 
at the end of his life, as he hung there dying, he hung beside of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in a moment of time, he looks at this person, and he says, Lord, and that's, no man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. He said, Lord, when you enter into your kingdom, remember me. Now, this is the new birth that happens for a man that would be considered the worst of sinners. He's dying. Oh. This guy's in a hopeless situation. And if you look back at the narrative, you look back at Matthew chapter 27, here's what it says of this guy that tells, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross. And you talk about arrogance. You let him come down, we'll believe him. He's raised the dead, restored sight to the blind, caused withered limbs to stretch forth, caused the lame to walk, fed 5,000 with fishes and loaves. I'm not going to try to guess at the number a little bit. Picked back up 12 baskets. You come down, do this. And we'll I tell you, if he'd have blasted down off that cross right then, they still wouldn't have believed. They, did, they, they didn't even believe when he was, did come down off the cross. Did they? He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. He will have him, for he saith, I am the Son of God. Now listen, the thieves also which were crucified with him. Now I've heard some people say, well, there was more than two. There was only two. One on the right, one on the left. Wasn't two on the left and two on the right. No, the thieves also that were crucified with Christ cast the same thing into Christ's teeth. In other words, they were both of them hanging on both sides, David ever said. You saved others, get us down and we'll believe you. Both of them. And in a moment, what happens? Lord. He, told, he tells it in Luke 23, read it for yourself. He tells this other guy when he's railing again, he says, we're getting exactly what we deserve. This man has done nothing amiss. Then he turns to our Lord and says, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom this day. In the last moment of his life, what happened? God regenerates him and God Almighty converts him. He does. And he sees a kingdom. <laughs> Think about that kingdom he sees. Here's a man beat beyond recognition, stripped naked, nails in his hand, nails in his feet, a thorn, sword thrusted into his side, blood and water coming out, crown of thorns crushed on his head. Now that's the kind of kingdom I'm looking for, aren't you? That really look. The Jews were looking for what? Somebody like David. They weren't looking for a savior. But this thief that's dying all of a sudden has a change of heart. Well, I think I'll exercise my free will and follow him. Not on your life. <laughs> a miracle of grace. The scales fall from his eyes. And he looks at this person and he knows and he understands my only hope is where? Right there. And what did our Lord say? This day you'll be with me where? In this kingdom. And I'm telling you, if he was in that kingdom, the only way he got in that kingdom was by righteousness. He had no part in producing or maintaining the righteousness. This person's established. That's what he saw. People say, it don't matter what. Oh, you better know this righteousness. Notice how he responds, and we'll quit with this. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? This is, this is supposed to be a teacher, a leader. Somebody had studied the Old Testament scriptures. What you see again here in this man's response to Christ's word is you see man, natural man's inability to discern or see the kingdom of God is what you see. This man was a spiritual ruler and leader among the Jews, and he was totally devoid of any spiritual understanding or discerning, and he was totally unable to know the things of God. 
I'll say this in close. Christ had spoke to him in simple, simple earthly words. Christ didn't try to speak to him about the Pythagorean theorem. I remember that killed me in geometry. That thing drove me crazy. And Christ didn't discuss with him the theory of relativity. I never understood E equals MC squared. I never could figure that one out. He tells him, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Yet, those simple words that our Lord uses to speak to this man of spiritual truth is like he was hearing what? The Pythagorean theorem and the theory of relativity. It was too complicated. People told me all along, you've got to be simplistic in the way you talk to people about the scripture. No, we've got to be truthful with people. Speak in terms our Lord speaks. Tell men the truth. It's, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They are spiritually discerned. The only way Nicodemus could ever see or enter this kingdom, and the only way any one of us are ever going to see or enter this kingdom, you know what's got to happen? You must be born Again, and we'll come back next week and we'll pick up verse 5 and we'll talk about the water and the blood next week. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. David, step